Welcome back for another episode of What's Your Story? We are sitting here at the Graves Library in a nice cool room. It is, I'm not even sure what the temperature is right now outside. I'm going to say it's in the 90s, I think. But luckily, the AC is on and we are sitting with Steve Price. Welcome to our show. Thank you. I've been following it online. <laughs> and we appreciate that, <laughs> one of our followers. So, um... I kind of cornered you earlier and said, hey, can you come back and, and sit with us? So we really appreciate you coming back on sure. such yeah. short notice. Um, but I think it's really important um, for two things. Uh, you are such a member of our community, and that's what this show is all about. And second, to talk a little bit about what you've been doing here at Graves um, since Christmas time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but first I'm gonna go all the way back to where you grew up. Where I grew up. Well, <clears throat> that's probably one of the more interesting things about me. <laughs> um, I was born in California, but um, I actually grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I grew up in Las Vegas in the late 1960s and early 1970s, back when Vegas was still a relatively small city. And it was, you know, the Ocean's Eleven Rat Pack Mm -hmm. mob run Las Vegas mm -hmm. that, you know people have in their head from that period <laughs> so what happened was that my parents divorced and when my mother remarried she married a musician and uh, he got a gig playing in the lounge shows in Las Vegas oh, wow. so we moved our family to Las Vegas and I stayed there through my first year of college and uh, grew up fast in some ways in Las Vegas <laughs> You know, my summer job um, was a lifeguard. I was a lifeguard at Caesars Palace in the Frontier Hotel. Wow. It probably sounds better than it is. But this was back in the day before we knew about skin cancer and sunscreen. And so we put baby oil on us and sit in the lifeguard stand, you know, for hours. And so I'm paying. Hope that no one yelled, help! Oh, yeah. I did have to go in a couple of times as a lifeguard. But... But growing up in Las Vegas had its perks. I mean, because my father was a musician, he was kind of in with the dealers, and he had what in Vegas is called juice, which is the power to get you into uh -huh. shows. Uh -huh. So I got to see Elvis Presley twice. You know, I saw The Fifth Dimension. I saw a lot of big stars, you know, that most people would never see, especially at that age, whether I appreciated them or not. My mother had to... <clears throat> almost forced me to go see Elvis Presley. Wow. Because I was growing up in the age where, you know, the English invasion and the Beatles and Presley, you know, mm -hmm. why? You know, that's my mother's <laughs> generation. But he had just had a successful concert from Hawaii, and it was kind of his comeback. Mm -hmm. And so they booked him in what was then the International Hotel, which is now the Hilton in Vegas. And she had to talk me into going, you know. I'm like, oh, wow, Elvis Presley, you know. And so I went, took my girlfriend. And he blew me away. Yeah. I mean, if you haven't heard Elvis Presley live, you can't appreciate what a talent the man was. He had an absolutely gorgeous voice. And he, it was just stunning. I, think, I don't think I talked for two days after that concert. Wow. And then I came back. I got an opportunity to see him two years later. He walked out on stage, and I thought, oh, he's joking. He stuck a pillow under his oh. house, yeah? He had this big old gut. <laughs> And he, he forgot his lyrics. I mean, he was already oh, starting to yeah. decline back then. But, yeah, Vegas, Vegas was an interesting place. Hotter than blazes, though different kind of heat than yeah, here. Yeah. We suffer the humidity here there. It's a dry desert, but it used to be 112 degrees in the summer. So, yeah, it was an interesting time. I remember the day he died. Um, it's one of, you know, sometimes you remember, like, where you were, when, yeah. you know, yeah. type thing. And um, I used to visit my godparents um, in the summertime. They were not blood relations. They were an older couple that my parents were friends with. And they used to come in summer in Saco. And uh, so my grandmother had these cottages and my parents lived there and took care of the property. And so this older couple would come every summer and I was born and they became my grandparents. So I, when I was like 9, 10, and 11, got to go to Connecticut and stay with them for like a month. And I have three older sisters, so I was spoiled rotten <laughs> going to, you know, take this trip by myself with these people. 
And um, so they would take me to, you know, many places. And we were on the highway and the announcement came over the radio and all the cars stopped on the highway and people got outside and they were, you know, they didn't know what to do. It was, yeah, it was stunning. Yeah. It was really stunning. So, I mean, probably, you know, hearing him in concert and then, um, and, you know, and now when you talk to people and you say, you know, they know him as, oh yeah, we saw him on the corner of the street the other day and then we saw him over, you know what I mean? The, the joke about Elvis being, right. right? So, but there, what an appreciation uh, to be able to have of his music and, yeah, I was lucky. I mean, I almost didn't go. Yeah. Thought, yes. Yeah. But and <laughs> he was he was an amazingly talented and handsome. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I some guy I shouldn't say that right, but he was just stunningly good looking. Yeah. yeah. He, um, he, was. He, he had he was the whole package. Yeah. He, he really yeah. Was, so. Um, and you said you stayed there through when you started college. Yeah, so? I went to UNLV my first year because I was. Not a particularly good high school student. I was much more interested in football and yeah. girls. Yeah. So I didn't get particularly good grades, so I wasn't going to go, you know, to Bowdoin, you know, or Bates. <laughs> um, so the only reason I went to college is I took the ACT, which is the equivalent of the SAT out here. Yeah. And I scored really high and shocked everyone, my parents in particular. It's <laughs> like, wait a second, this is the right Steve Price. <laughs> I thought, mm, okay, you know, give it a try. So I stayed home for a year, went to college, which had its upsides, had its downsides. But it, I loved college, and I realized, oh, I can do this. And then I ended up going to Utah and finishing my college mm -hmm. years in Utah because I was introduced to downhill skiing by some of my friends, and that became a passion. So I went to Utah. For, so from the heat to the cold. Yeah, the funny thing, and it sort of leads to how I came to New England, I, I was growing up in Las Vegas, but I was always attracted to the East Coast and the North for reasons I can't explain. I just remember looking through magazines and seeing ads from New England. I thought, oh man, what a beautiful place. I'd love to live here. Or somewhere where there's actually green, you know, <laughs> water, <laughs> no hotels, you know. I mean, Vegas is a funny place. So, and I just, it's a long story how I got here, but I eventually made my way first to Massachusetts and then to Maine. Yeah. So how long have you been in Maine? I'm cracking 30 some years. Okay. Um, yeah, pretty close to 30 years, I think. I lived in Portland for a while before I moved here. Yeah. The reason I came here is um, I was hired as the director of communications at the University of New England. Yeah. And uh, eventually moved here and met my wife, Linda Ward. And, uh, had a blind date at Allison's <laughs> oh, <very laughs> that worked nice. out, one of the few blind dates <laughs> that worked out. And so here I am and we're living in her old house, which has been in her family for three generations. Yeah. Has a deed that goes back to 1690. Oh my so goodness. So it's probably one of the oldest houses in the, in the town. So you and me, you, you were there, um, so you were there through all of its expansion. What Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean... When you started there, it wasn't as big as it is now. No, not by a long shot. When I started, you know, I was young and ambitious, and for me, I thought it was going to be a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought, well, I'll work here, and then I'll apply for a really good college somewhere. <laughs> and, but the thing was, it, it was such a great time to be there because it dawned on me that it was more interesting to be at a place that was becoming mm -hmm. than something that had already become. Mm -hmm. You know, and I... I had the credentials, I probably could have gone on to an, maybe a small Ivy League school, but, and I worked very closely with the presidents, you know, as the director of communications, and I just liked it. And yeah. UNE was growing like crazy, and it was a, just a fascinating, interesting time to be there. Yeah. And I think, you know, being in Biddeford, you don't hear of Biddeford being a college town. You never hear it talked about or advertised or... No. It's, no. it's kind of tucked <clears throat> down the... You know, Route 9. Yeah, it's, it's, off the, of it's, off, it's off the beaten path. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's never... There was a time when UNE was looking for a second campus, and, you know, the Westbrook campus, formerly Westbrook College campus, was available. But we were also, at the time, looking at developing some buildings in Biddeford. And I was hoping 
that the university would go that way because mm -hmm. it would have done tremendous things for the city. Yeah. But it wasn't a, it wasn't good for from the college's point of view because they already had the other campus and it had buildings and right. blah blah blah. Right. So they ended up building their dental dental school and their pharmacy school on the Westbrook campus in Portland. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, yeah, it it, that, it would have changed Biddeford, and I hope that it did, but it just wasn't. I think it fun. has now. I mean, I think looking back, um, you know, there's just the students that are coming to school, and I think sticking around. Yeah, that would be nice. I mean, um, I think the students come here, you know, like UNE is, tends to be professional oriented, the health sciences, marine science, mm -hmm. and they come here, and then they discover you know, what a wonderful place being is. Yeah. And that's just kind of reversing the brain drain of our own kids, you know, who mm -hmm. can't wait to get out. <laughs> yeah. Many of them come back, but they want to escape for a while. And uh, <clears throat> so I do, I see some of the some of the students that I remember have stayed. I'll see mm -hmm. them in the grocery store yeah. or somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. I think I've heard a few stories of parents that um, the students will get um, housing off, off campus, and it's usually either in Hills Beach or... Yeah. Biddeford Pool, um, sometimes Goose Rocks, and when the parents come visit, they say, wow, this is nicer than the house that you came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah. it's such a beautiful area. It was probably to like, their advantage that, uh, you know, when I first went there, they didn't have a lot of housing at uni. They mm -hmm. couldn't house mm -hmm. all their students because they were growing too fast. So, yeah. putting them out in the community is what was eye-opening for students and their parents. Yeah. Um, we had we have a cottage on our property, and we rented to students who went to U and E, and they thought they were in heaven, you know, I living in Kent. I bet they did. Yeah. 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 And it's um, and I I just see a lot more outreach that they've been doing, um, you know, in the last twenty years, and I just think it's 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 pretty amazing. So. Yeah, um, it's a tr it's a true success story, and I yeah. was happy. It was really the apex of my career. I had sixteen years there. Mm -hmm. He came very close to Sandra Fellerman, who was president there when yeah. I was there. She died a few years ago. But uh, yeah, it was a great experience for me. And so I stayed for a long time. That's great. Um, are you still affiliated with the farmer's market? I am not. I was the manager. They, I was the first non-market person manager they hired. Okay. And this is the farmer's market in, in Kenny, Kenny Bunk. Bunk, yes. Yeah. And... Um, so they hired me in the middle of a season two years ago, two and a half years ago. And I did it for a year and a half, and I really liked it. I really loved the market, mm -hmm. and I love the farmers. Yeah. But some things happened in my life, my wife and I, my life, that just made it difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'm a consumer. Now you're a consumer. Yeah. yeah. And I, I consult with their new manager if, you know, if they yeah. need anything. And they, you know, I just saw her and turned over some graphics for her and yeah. stuff. But I'm not directly involved anymore. That's a that's a <clears> great <throat> market on Saturdays. Yeah, it is a good market. I don't go there often because we have one in Saco, and um, but every time I go there, that's like a special treat to go to the Kenny Bug Market. Yeah, so. that, that market has a good reputation, and the the people who work there say it's one of the best markets in Maine. It's just mm -hmm. very friendly, you know, and it works. It's smoothly and people aren't at each other's throats. So. Great variety. Yeah, good variety yeah. and it changes all the time. So So since you know them all, do you get any special discounts when you go? <laughs> talk, talk to me after the interview. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so, um, so when we um, started doing um, fireside readings here at the holiday season, we asked you to, if you would be willing to read... A story um, so putting it on Facebook and YouTube and then something kind of percolated in your mind um, and then you did something about it can you talk to us a little bit about the port side readers yeah so um, I was very honored that you asked me to read and so I went and picked out a very serious <laughs> dark story for the holidays called silent snow secret snow and read that because it was a story that I always admired. And, and then, you know, and I went up, God, I think I went up first. And then watching the series, I realized that I was the only one who read anything mm -hmm. for adults. Mm -hmm. and, and that makes sense. It's Christmas. People were reading things for children. And, 
but it got me thinking. You know, you do a lot of great stuff for children here. You have, you know, re, you know, the reading hour and storybook time and all kinds of things. And I thought, oh, you know, we, I kind of missed being read to. You know, you, you get read to a, in your life maybe twice by people you know and love. Like when you're a baby, right. your parents read to you. Maybe kindergarten, first grade teacher you get read to. And then after that, it's not until you're like on the morphine drip at the other end of life that yeah. someone might, you yeah. know and care about is yeah. sitting down next to you, you know, in your so hospital true. bed and reading to you. I mean, there's audio books and Audible and all that, but it's different, you know, that's like going... It's not intimate. Yeah, that's yeah. like going to the theater, that's so professional. And I just thought, well, you know, I know a lot of people who like, who are serious readers and like to read, maybe you could pull together a half dozen of them who might want to read and... And just like that, well, you did. You gave me the okay. I don't think I spent more than half a day on the phone. I just got, yes, yes, I'd love to do that. Yes, yes. And it's a great group of talented people. Several of them, three of them actually have theater experience. And they kind of put the rest of us in the shade as far as reading. But, um, yeah, and they're just so enthusiastic about it. They love doing it. And so we had our second recording session this morning. Yeah. And uh, it's a nice eclectic mix of stories and nonfiction and uh, God, we love it. I, you know, and we're getting some good views. Some people are getting, you know, 700, 500 views and that's fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, I love how you have um, sort of set the tone for the group too. You've all come together. You all sit together in the room as one person is in the hot seat reading and you're very supportive of each other and I think that's really important when you're when you're doing something like this because if you were in a book group you know everybody would be there but when you're doing something in front of the camera one-on-one -on -one, um, I think to have that you know that support sitting there and cheering you on is is really um, you know I think that what you've done to um, to make that happen has been has been really special. Uh, well, thank you. It's very so. kind of you to, to say. I mean, what I realized from the first one is I wanted that first session to be a bonding session, mm -hmm. and that was accomplished by having everyone here for everyone's read, and you sit through everyone's read, you know. And it's nice to have kind of an audience, you know. When I did my reading, I was glad to have Mike there. He was my audience, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a different. Dynamic, I think. And it's also inspiring. It's also humbling, you know. When some of the people in the group are such fine readers. I mean, they're like yeah. professionals. Yeah. And, you know, I give her blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and, but it's inspiring, you know, and uh, it makes you want to be better, a better reader. So you mentioned that you recorded earlier today. Um, what did you read for this session? I read a classic American short story called The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. And I think most people have probably experienced the lottery at some point in their life, though they don't remember it. It's, it used to be on the high school curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had it explained to you, you'd go, oh, yeah, I remember that story. But right. it's a very powerful story with a very upsetting ending. And it's kind of about, well, maybe I shouldn't talk about what it's about. It, it's, <laughs> you know, it's open for discussion, but it's, Conformity gone mad, as someone once mm -hmm, described mm -hmm. it. You know? And I'm not sure that she was writing about a New England town, the village that's the setting for it, but it could well be. Yeah. You know, New England. Yeah. It's got that sort of old, crusty... It does. We've been doing it for 100, yeah. 300 years. We're going to do it again. Kind of sense to it. And uh, it's just a story that's always appealed to me. It wasn't my first choice... I, was, I really wanted to read a story called um, The Man Who Saw Through Heaven, which is a short story most people don't know. But it was too long. I just couldn't get it into that 20-minute, mm -hmm. yeah. you know. So I had to find something else. And I thought, well, the lottery, it's like a ringer story. It's just, even if you're a bad reader, I'm not a bad reader, but I'm not a great reader, the story carries it, yeah. you know. It's just, yeah. it's an amazing piece of literature. So. It is. So watch. <laughs> yes. Um, and that is every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We have a reader that's on Facebook, YouTube, and our local television station. Um, is there a background on Shirley Jackson? Do you know like how she came to write that story? Um, you know, I don't. I wish I had more insight. I should probably do a little research. 
I don't um, remember. I, 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 mean, I remember reading it in school, but I can't remember if we even looked into, like, how does... I mean, that's it's pretty dark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very dark. What is, I don't know what it would be to picks all these dark stories. But, um, yeah, as a matter of fact, I, and I mentioned this in my intro <clears throat> on the reading, is it was published in, first published in 1948 in The New Yorker. Mm-hmm. And when it was published, The New Yorker got more readers' comments on that story than in any piece of fiction it had ever published. Wow. And some people were angry. And some people recognized it was an instant classic, but it was very yeah. provocative. Yeah. You know, really generated a lot of conversation. Yeah. But I think uh, reading it today would be even more. There would be even more of conversation in many different ways, just some of the things that we've been oh, through. Oh, yeah. It, it's a great sort of book club right. story to talk about right. or a classroom yeah. story because... It just opens up all kinds of potential for human behavior yes. and culture, yeah. Yeah. you know, and tradition and yeah. violence. It's just you're so right. You know, when we have <clears throat> speaking of book groups, we have book groups today. Um, I don't know many book groups that will pick classics, like the book group that we have here in the evening. Um, it's usually new stuff, mm. new fiction, nonfiction, and I don't know. I think we need to do a better job of. Going back a little bit and looking at some of these things because they are, t- I mean, that's why they're classics, yeah, right? Yeah. But there's so much more to add to them today. Yeah, so. well, that's what, that's what I had in mind when I started this group. I thought it'd be a combination of old classics that people either don't know or don't remember, mm-hmm. regional work or original work. So some of us, you know, I read some of my newspaper essays and today um, Cynthia Graves read some really lovely poetry and... Uh, an essay about her garden. So, you know, I encourage them, if That's they're great. writers, mm-hmm. to read something. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get, you know, Lee Child's best <laughs> in our group, but uh, you get something something a little different. Ah, that's amazing. Um, and you're going to, we hope, continue this. As long as people, you know, enjoy it and like, keep half a dozen readers going. That's I great. mean, they can't, they're off already looking for their next... I mean, they're having the time of their lives. They're already yeah. looking for their next piece to read. So now if somebody called the library and said, hey, I really like that group, could I join that group? Do you have... Yeah, well, that's... Could we you know, just have that person t- contact you? Yes. Would you be okay with that? Yes. As a matter of fact, that's how we got Cynthia. Um, okay. You know, I originally had half a dozen people, and then a couple of them, because of work or family, kind of pulled back. And um, you, um, Lisanne, had produced some posters for us, mm-hmm. and I was out. I put one in Panera, and Cynthia saw it and called oh. me, and her timing was right. So I like to keep a core group of about six, uh-huh. and that will change from time to time. Right. But we'd also committed to having guest readers. Okay. You know, I, there's just lots and lots of people who would be tremendous at this. Yeah. You know, oh, that's really Joe good. Foster, if you're oh, out there, yes, we, yes. we're going to be calling you. <laughs> we, we, everyone says, have you asked Joe Foster? <laughs> so we definitely, he doesn't know it's coming, but we have, we have to get him on board. That but yeah, we'd like to have guest readers. And the other thing that you and I have talked about a little bit is possibly around holidays doing some readers' theater. Absolutely. You know, because yeah. a lot of readers' theater is based on Halloween and Christmas and those kinds of holidays. And yeah. And uh, Val Reed is in particular, you know, she was a director, a theatrical director, and she knows how to produce Reader's Theater, so wow. she'll kick us off. We are going to do this. We are definitely going to do this. Yeah. And as long as our friend Mike is ready to roll with the camera, okay, good, <laughs> good. So we'll, we'll definitely um, keep that going. And then, um, you know, having, having a few Reader's Theaters and just... Do them as a pop up would be really yeah pretty just fabulous. As an extra yeah, you can do them around the holiday date. So um, so for our finishing off, we do like a rapid fire question round. Oh, I where you my just, brains. You just have person. to even one word answers are fine, and they're really not that. Hard. So okay, are you ready to go with this? I guess. All right. What is your favorite color? Orange. Your favorite book. Oh. It used to be Dog Soldiers, but now it might be News of the World. Okay. Uh, favorite vacation spot? Vacation spot. 
Well, I went to Hawaii once. That was pretty wonderful. You wouldn't say you wouldn't say Nevada. <laughs> I don't go to Nevada for vacations. I go to Nevada because I have to see my family. Where did you go? you said Hawaii? I went to Hawaii. Oh, I should also call. I love love Southern Utah. I love Arches National. Oh, okay, National. yeah. Um, favorite restaurant. It doesn't have to be local. It can be anywhere. Well, when do I love Joshua's? That's, oh, okay. That's yeah. A good one. Um, favorite cocktail. Um, well, I learned to be a bourbon drinker recently, <laughs> and, I, and I, so I started making Manhattans just because oh, I was reading a book. And what Dry they, or sweet? It was dry. Okay. Yeah, I was dry, and I thought, well, I'll make it. And I lasted for about a week, so I don't usually <laughs> like mixed drinks. I will drink a gin and tonic in the summer, but I'm more of this, give me the straight booze kind of guy okay, okay. On, the, on, on the rocks. On the rocks, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what is your favorite thing to do locally? Um, well, I took up, when I retired six years ago, I took up fly fishing. I love to fly fish. Oh, really I did is. not know that. Yeah, it's a, it's become a passion of mine. It's another thing I'm trying to be better at. But my father was a fisherman. He wasn't a fly fisherman, but mm -hmm. he introduced me to fishing. Yeah. And it stuck, and then I went for decades and didn't fish in it. When I was retiring, sort of planning out retirement, what are you going to do with your time? I decided to take up fishing again, but I was going to take up fly fishing. Mm -hmm. So I got a basic casting course at L.L. Bean, and it just clicked with me. Yeah. Me, so. Where do you go around here? Well, the Mousam River at the right time is good. I really love uh, the Maryland River. Okay. In yeah. Wales, it's a beautiful little river. Yeah. You know, and southern Maine trout fishing is not the best in the world. It's not like western Maine or northern Maine, but it's good enough. I, I like to fish on the Kenny Bunk Pond, catch mm -hmm. bass on Kenny mm -hmm. Bunk Pond. Mm -hmm. Got a little float seat. I just go around, cruise around the coast and catch bass. And Does any of your writing involve fly so, fishing? Yeah, several of my newspaper essays have been about fly fishing. As a matter of fact, I wrote one. We were, we were snowbirds this year, and I went to Florida. And <clears throat> I was fishing in a bayou down there, and someone had um, hooked a pelican, oh. and the pelican had swallowed the lure, and I wrote an essay about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've probably written half a dozen essays that have fly fishing related themes to them. How do we find those? Do we do we look on, um, the, the, is a Portland Press Herald, do, do, do they come through that way if you're doing a search? Yeah, so the essays I've been writing have been primarily in the Portsmouth Herald about 10 years oh, ago. Portsmouth they, Herald, or okay. No I, no, I said that. I mean the Portland Press? Portland okay. Press Herald. Yep, yep. Not Portsmouth. About 10 years ago, they started a column called The Main Observer. Okay. It's just an open contribution anybody can write to. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I've been writing those for years. And then a few years later, they started <clears throat> a thematic column called Meeting House where Every month they give a theme mm -hmm. that people can write. And so I've written several of those too. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, they get posted online and they sit up there for yep. a while. But um, oh, that's great. I was putting together a scrapbook the other day and realized I've published like 65 of these things. So you need to get them together in a. Yeah, I'm putting together a scrapbook <laughs> so when I'm dead and gone, the grandkids can say. Oh, well, wow, people at the library might like to check them out, so think yeah. about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and um, our last question is always, what's your favorite library? It doesn't have to be this one, but, well. <laughs> but we do pay you greatly if you... I mean, it was in Alexandria, but it burned down. So. Okay, there you go. <laughs> of course it's this one. And you said I was a good member of the community. It makes me feel guilty because I'm not a good enough member well. of the community. I'm striving to be a better member of the community. We think you are. We think you are. We're, we'll keep you. Yeah, keep me. So, and we hope that you check that out um, Steve and his merry band of readers on Wednesday nights on Facebook and YouTube and our local channel, 1301. And um, we really appreciate you putting that group together and um, having that, I mean, just it's just a, uh, a wonderful array and um, Re that's community, you know, coming together like that and, and doing something for the rest of us to enjoy is, we really appreciate that. Well, our dirty that. little secret is it's a labor of love. And <laughs> all the readers absolutely love doing it, so it's not exactly a high price. Yeah. Okay. 
Well, <clears throat> thank you for being on our show today. Yeah, thank you for asking me on short notice. Yes, and... yes. And um, if you want to stick around, um, you are welcome to do that because it's really hot outside and it's nice in here. <laughs> uh, you know, I do have an air-conditioned car to go to the air-conditioned grocery store. There you go, to go store. to the grocery store. That's right. So, yeah. um, so anyway, thank you so much for, well, for being our you. guest. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time on What's Your Story? <laughs>